All right, with the recent advances in AGI, notably the Q star algorithm by OpenAI, I thought we'd dive into a little bit of the background of what people suspect that it is. Now, keep in mind, Q star could have nothing to do with anything that we're talking about, but everyone's speculating around what that could be. And I thought it'd be good to go back to the basics and look at what is Q learning, and you know what what is it what does it do uh, and how has it been used recently or not so recently namely in this paper right here uh, playing atari with deep reinforcement learning by deepmind which was one of the first papers that really catapulted deepmind to the forefront of everyone's attention uh, so it's not going to be sort of state of the art research today. It's more going to be a basic introduction into Q learning. I've actually done a video on this particular paper before, if you want to know more about this paper today, it's really going to be about Q learning in general. So let's dive in Q learning, we're in the field of so called reinforcement learning. And again, we'll keep an eye on the application, how that might apply to a language model, or something like this, as we go through this. But in the basic sense in reinforcement learning, you have your agent over here, that is the ugliest a I have ever seen. So you'll have your agent over here, and you'll have an environment. And the environment is giving the agent what's called an observation. O. okay, um, the agent is going to react to that observation. And uh, then reply with an action a the environment is going to take that action and give the agent a reward and a next observation. Okay, and this is the basic cycle in reinforcement learning. This is the most basic concept, uh, the agent gets these observations uh, from the environment, then responds with actions based on those observations. And the uh, environment after the first step, it always gives a reward, how good the last action was. Now, there are multiple configurations of this. Um, so the one simplification we are going to do today, let's say, is that we're going to say the observation is always equal to the state. Um, this is so called Markovian fully, fully observable um, decision process. And that's just going to simplify things a lot. So when we say observation, or when we say state today will mean the same thing. Think of a chessboard, you observe the chessboard, as it is, okay, here is maybe a simplified chessboard, you observe that, you know, the, the rook is here, and the queen is here, and so on, you observe it once, and that's everything you need to know. That's the whole state of the game. There's nothing hidden, there's nothing dependent on something in the past, which is actually not true in chess, uh, whether you can castle or not, is actually dependent on kind of the past history. And today, we'll also just ignore that. So you're in a given state, and you're asked to make an action, and that will lead to some reward. Now, in chess, uh, you already see that that's not really true in the colloquial sense. So if I move the rook over here, maybe that was a really bad move, maybe that was a really good move. Uh, it doesn't matter unless it's a checkmate, I don't get any reward at all, right. So my reward from the environment in chess is whether I have won or lost the game. And that only happens at the very end of the game, no matter how good my moves are in between, uh, I will not get any reward from the environment environment uh, until the very last step. And that's a problem in reinforcement learning. So I can go from state to state from step to step, I can go through this game and all and I only get a reward here at the end. Now, this is a very tricky situation for a system to learn, because how are you going to know whether the move you made here was ultimately the correct move, you have a very similar, uh, you have a very similar challenge when you do like sequence to sequence learning with uh, language models, because first you go through a sequence, right, and then you output the sequence over here. So this would be the encoded stage. And then from here on, you'll decode. And as if 
it's as if you wouldn't get a loss each token that you produce, but only at the very end, someone would look at the whole sentence and say, well, that's pretty good. Or no, that's pretty bad, right. And in fact, that, you know, that's what we do when we do reinforcement learning, uh, even for RL. So reinforcement learning doesn't necessarily mean you only get reward at the end, but many environments are structured such that only after you've sort of completed the entire episode, you get a reward at the end, and you need to sort of figure out what was good and what was bad that you done yet yeah, you've done in the meantime. And Q learning is one way that uh, you know, is, is kind of good at let's say mitigating that and doing this credit assignment. So the assignment of, you know, this actually depended on oopsie, dependent on moves that I've done before. So how do we go about this? Formally, well, let's not go too formal, we have, this is called a, a mark of decision process, um, fully observable, as we said, and that means that I'm always in some kind of a state I take an action, I go to a next state. So state one, I transition to state two by doing action one. If I did action two, instead, I'm going to transition to state three, um, maybe from state three, if I do action one, I transition to state two, and so on. So I can move around these states by performing these actions. Also, we're just going to consider that you always have the same actions available in no matter what state you're in. It's also not entirely true. But um, yeah, so I need to figure out I'm in a given state, right? And I need to figure out what action should I do. And one way to go about that is to have a function that takes in a state and gives me an action. That is that that is possible. Um, that is if you do any sort of uh, actor critic reinforcement learning or something like this policy gradient methods, uh, they do this. So they train, a, they learn a function that you input a state, and it's going to give you an action. Uh, and it doesn't explain how or why or anything like this. Um, today, we're not going to do that, we're, we're going to do something different. I'm going to say, I'm going to define a function q. And what q is going to do, q is going to take in a state and an a proposed action, a proposed action. So you're in state S, and you're saying, if I did task A, what would my total reward, reward, my total reward be, if I did action A, so you're in some state here, right, you could go here, you could go here, from here, you could go in many different places, or right? and, and, and at some point, Da, 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 there will be end states. And in the end states, this is a good one. And this here might be a bad one. And you don't know how you how you get to to these, right? So you're in state in this state here. And you're asking yourself, which action should I do? Should I do action one? Or should I do action two? Well, if you had this function, what it would tell you is, okay, if I plug in, if I plug in a one here, let's say, I plug it in, I am in state s, this is state s, I plug in a one, sorry, a one, this gives me five, q of s and a two gives me 10. Obviously, I'm going to choose 10. So I'm going to choose a two. So the q function is a function, but don't worry how it comes about the q function is a function that in current state, you give it a proposed action, it tells you how your total reward from here on out, how much that's going to be if you now do action, whatever action you plug in, that is missing a little bit of information, if you've realized that, uh, namely, even if I do action a two here, I'm going to be in this state, I'm still going to have options even after that. Right. So just because I now decide to do a two, after that, I can still and I probably will have to choose many more times what to do until I finally reach some sort of good or bad end state. So in order for this Q function to be well defined, I also have to specify what I do after that. And what I do after that is, is that's 
called a policy. So a policy, and I previously called it F, um, but technically, or not technically, commonly it's called uh, pi. So pi of s, uh, this is a policy. Um, you give in a state s and it tells you do action A. Sometimes this can be formulated in a probabilistic manner. So you can say my uh, probability of doing action A given state s can be defined as this. So it's going to give you like a, uh, a probability for action A given state s. But we can also go the deterministic case right here and say a policy, you give it a state, and it's going to tell you go left, go right, go up, go down. Uh, note, the policy says nothing about reward, the policy is simply, you could write it down, right, you could make a table and say, well, if you're in this state, do this, if you're in this state, do this. And it, there can be good policies, which lead to high reward, and there could be bad policies, which lead to low reward. In fact, policies can be kind of ordered. So you can say, you know, a policy is better than policy one is better than policy two, if in any state you can be in uh, the actions, if you follow policy one, you get a better reward than if you follow policy two. But obviously, these are not, um, there's not a total ordering in that sense. Uh, because for some, it, it can really depend on the state. But never mind. So I hope you realize the difference between a policy, a policy is simply a function that tells you what to do. And there can be good policies and bad policies. And the Q, the Q function. Now we can fully define it. So in order to fully define a Q function, I would have to also supply it with a policy. So usually you say this. So q, q pi of s and a one tells you you're in your in state s. If you were to now take action a one in this state, and after that, do whatever the policy pi tells you to do, then you would get a reward of five. However, if you're in the state now and do action two, and after that, equally just do what policy pi tells you to do, then you would be in, uh, in a reward of 10. Okay. So in a sense, what the Q function tells us is that we'll commit to following a particular policy after this step. But for this step, we don't really know what to do. So we plug each action into the Q function say, well, after this step, I'm going to follow this policy right here. But please tell me what to do right now. And the Q function evaluates each action and tells you a reward that it thinks, you know, after taking this action now, and then following the policy, uh, we will the total reward you'll get until the end of the episode. Uh, by the way, we haven't really specified reward and episodes right now. So in classic reinforcement learning, you always kind of assume that the episodes go for an infinite time horizon. Um, so your total reward is going to be the reward that you get at step one, plus the reward you get at step two, plus the reward you'll get at step three, and so on. Now, you can see that if this goes on for an infinitely long amount of time, you can get infinite reward. Uh, so what people do, even in the finite cases, people say there's a discount factor. So plus gamma three, r three, uh, r four, and so on. So, well, okay, I kind of screwed up my indices here. But <laughs> we'll essentially say, you know, as time progresses, the rewards are going to be worth less and less in the now, right? So the if I and that's similar to how humans perceive reward, I guess, if it's further in the future, it's worth less to me now, okay, it's going to be worth more in the future, obviously, but it's worth less to me now, if you promise me $100 tomorrow, uh, than if you just give me $100 right now. And that's not because I'm unsure about the tomorrow, right? It's just because uh, I'd like to have it right now. <laughs> we can there are other discount factors that model things like uncertainty, um, either in the problem or in our estimation of it. 
but the basic the basics basic total reward can be calculated as a sum and here i'm going to switch my switch my indices of gamma to the i so i goes from 0 to possibly infinity or t uh, of the reward i'm going to get in that particular step okay so this this reward here is what I want to maximize the total reward across the episode. And as we said, if, if this here, if our episodes are such like in chess, that just once at the very end, I'm going to get a reward, um, we might as well set the discount factor here to just one. And because it this is going to unroll to just the the last reward anyway. So uh, actually, hmm. I to T. So this is going to, this is going to be reward R I equals T something like this. This is not super well written, is it? Um, but you hope you understand what I mean. So if we only get one reward, we might as well and we don't care how long the episodes are, right? In chess, don't care how long a game is. If I win, I win. Doesn't matter if it's in 20 or in 60 moves. We might as well put the discount factor to one and, and just take the last reward. Um, but in normal, regular reinforcement learning, there's discount factor. So why I did that, it's important to understand uh, the, the framing of the Q function. And we could ask ourselves why is this five and this 10, right? Picture yourself, you're on a chess board, right? And you have only two moves available. And you ask the Q function, you tell the Q function, okay, I'm gonna, I have like, I have like, uh, I don't know, I have like Gary Kasparov on the phone or Magnus Carlsen. And I'm gonna, I, I can call him after this move, right? So that I'm, I'm gonna, this is the, this is like, a good policy, I know, but I just need to know what I have to do in this particular move right now. After that, I'm going to call Magnus Carlsen and, and he's going to tell me whatever to, to do. But, you know, how should I move my rook or should I move my queen? And the Q function is going to tell you, well, if you move your rook, uh, you're, even if you call Magnus Carlsen after that, your total reward is going to be five. But if you move your queen right now and then call Magnus Carlsen, your total reward is going to be 10. Why? It's important to understand the reason why these numbers could be different. And there could be two reasons. Reason one, which is probably what you're thinking first is that, well, the current action of moving the queen just gives me a higher reward, right? Just um, actually chess isn't really good example for this. So it could be that in a reinforcement learning problem, just the current action to it just gives you immediate five reward, right? And after that, you'll go on, whereas action one gives you no reward right now. And that's why it's five different. But there is another reason. And that could that's, if you're playing chess, then that for sure is the reason, namely, um, even though you're following the same policy, after that, you will end up in a different state if you take the two actions. So if you take action one versus if you take action two, you'll be in a different starting state. So if you're here, take action one, you'll be in this state, whereas if you take action two, you'll be in this state. Now these actions could be on their own relatively neutral, but because you're in a different state, you will have much less chances of ending up in a bad or a good state depending on the state you're in. So the Q function encompasses both of those things like how good the current action is in the current step, and also how good the current action is looking ahead in the state that you'll be in. And that's going to be lead us to the one of the fundamental um, equations, recurring equations in Q learning, which is going to be the Bellman equation. The fundamental thing here is this the Q value in state s of action a and following policy uh, i after so after the next step is what's that going to be well that's going to be the reward of performing action a in step uh, action a in state s 
So the immediate reward of that step, um, I think before we've gone capital R, let's go lowercase r. So let's say, let's say like capital R is the total reward, and that's going to be the sum of discounted lowercase r's, okay, and the lowercase r are the um, rewards I get in the individual steps. Okay? So the Q value is going to be what reward do I get in the immediate step that I'm taking, right, I'm gonna maybe that's zero, right, but there in there could be a reward right there if I put a checkmate, it's a one, if I am in uh, doom, and I shoot some monster, I do get actual points, right? So th th this is reward. Uh, note that there is no pi is not here. And that's because pi only matters after the next step. So that the uh, the reward is only the current step plus whatever comes whatever reward I'm going to make from the state that I end up. So let's just say, let's just say, if I'm in state S, and I perform action A, I'm going to end up in state S prime, okay, we'll, we'll understand or we'll understand or maybe S prime A or something like this, we'll understand that means the state that I'm going to end up with, if I am in state S and take action A. So the reward that I'm going to end that I'm going to achieve in the whole rest of the game uh, from this state. Well, what's that going to be? Isn't that just going to be the reward in S prime? You know, and then what action am I going to take here? Um, oh, I could say uh, I can take the action whatever pi of S prime is going to tell me to do. And uh, I'll do that for all the s, like for all the for all the s primes that are coming up. I hope that's clear. So in the next step, I am going to just ask, well, what does pi tell me? Um, what does what does pi tell me to do? That's the action I'm going to take, I'm going to get some reward, I'm going to get into a new state, and then I'm going to ask, ask pi again, what action should I do? I'm going to take that action, I'm going to get some reward, and so on. So this reward is going on until the end. And we've split up our, we split up our problem in two parts, the left part here is not dependent on that pi. And the right part here is not dependent on the a right here. Okay. Now, we can think of something and say, well, actually, here, sorry about the one apple pen confusion. This thing here, I just I just said, well, um, I have Magnus Carlson on the phone, why don't I just kind of call Magnus Carlson right now, right? Uh, and that's, that's, that's one thing, okay, that would just solve the problem. The other thing that I could do is, I could say, well, if I have this Q function available, if I have it available, if I can ask the Q function, you know, what, what should I do right now to get like, the best or to get their reward to get, like, I can ask for a given action, what reward will I get across all the game, right, for a given action right now, which means that I can define a policy, a policy, and we're going to call that policy, uh, pi Q for now. And the policy takes in a state, and it's going to give me an action. And I'm just going to say, how about how about I just always whatever state I'm in, I'm always going to ask my Q function what to do. So and I'm always going to take whatever the maximum is, right, I'm just going to plug every action into the Q function. And it's going to tell me a number. And I will just do whatever the highest whatever action leads to the highest number. And that is a policy, right? That is if I at every step, just do that. Just do ask my Q function. Uh, that is a policy, because I can plug in a state. And I will get out an action. Now, again, this Q function is incomplete. 
we have to supply it a policy. And here is where the recursion comes in. I'm going to tell the queue function, I'm going to what happens if I'm going to do action a right now. And in the future, I'm going to act according to the policy where in each step, I ask you Q function, what the best action is. So this, it's it's I'm making it more complicated than it is. But uh, essentially, we're defining a policy that's defined itself by always asking the Q function what I should do right now, if I intend to follow the Q function also in the future. And if the Q function is actually good, then that is going to be the the optimal policy. So we call it like a Q star of s is going to be I'll always select the maximum, the maximum action according to my Q function, um, by following the optimal policy after I did that. And that is called the Bellman equation. Um, and it gives us hints on how we can learn these things. Now you have to imagine Q learning, it can be done in many, many different ways. But essentially, what it boils down to is the following. So I am in a state s, I ask my Q function, hey, max a, okay, of Q s a, I ask that it's going to give me an action. Actually, I'm only going to do that with one minus epsilon amount of times. And in epsilon amount of times, I'm just going to take some some kind of a some kind of a random, random action, uh, explore exploit, right? Sometimes I just want to do something else, because uh, I might not, might not be the best right now. So the Q function, um, I don't have I did not pull this up correctly. <laughs> so imagine, I don't have the Q function. Now, so far, we've always imagined we have this magical Q function that just knows everything about our problem and can tell us accurately what will happen in the future. Now, obviously, if I have that, I can just always ask it, you know, which of these actions is the best one. And that's precisely what we can't do, if we don't know anything about the problem. And therefore, Q learning is all about can we learn this Q function. So the Q function is now going to be parameterized somehow. And it needs to take a state and an action and it has to tell me some sort of some sort of an estimate of R. Okay. Um, imagine, imagine I am in a reinforcement learning problem, right? I am here, my little figure is here. And I ask, it goes this way. And there is I don't know, it's the dinosaur game. And then it's not a person, it's a dinosaur, is it? But let's say there is a bird coming at me, and I ask, should I uh, jump or should I duck? Right. And these are the two actions. And let's say I choose either one. Now, Q learning can even be performed as, as far as I'm aware, you don't always have to choose the maximum Q, you can do a bit of exploration here. So you've actually performed some sort of action, and you've gotten some sort of reward of that step. Now, what does the Bellman equation tell us? The Bellman equation tells us that uh, the Q of pi Q of the state s and action a should be the reward I'm going to get um, in state s and action a plus uh, the discounted future reward. And that's going to be the discounted Q value um, of Q did I discount over here? I probably did not. I probably did not discount over here. Um, of being in S prime A. So I've done action A, I gotten I've, I, I've that had led to reward R, maybe reward is positive, because I'd, I ducked, I got a little bit further, and that gives me a few points. And I've am in a new state S prime, the new state is I'm ducked under here under the bird. Now, what I can do is, um, I can kind of self regress. So Q learning can be done in multiple ways. Uh, the easiest thing is to have a table, literal table, that says that has the state s and the action a. So it tell it would tell me, well, if you're in state one and do action one, then you're 
Q value is going to be five. If you're in state one, do action two, your Q value is going to be 10. If you're in state two and do action one, your Q value is going to be eight and so on. Okay. If we don't know anything yet, we'll just fill this here with random values. Yeah. Now there's obviously also a different method which you might be more used to and that's we'll build some sort of neural network it takes in a representation of the state so the state is going in as some sort of embedding or image right here there's going to be some sort of a neural network and then there's going to be one output for each of the possible actions and then each of these is going to give you a value there's also different methods with neural network where you'll have as an input the state and you'll have actions also as an input encoded. So this part encodes the state and this part encodes the action and the neural network is just going to give you one output, one number. However you do it, right? you have to initialize with kind of random numbers and then what you'll do is you'll simply use your own estimate as a target. So you're essentially saying, well, whatever the Q function is, um, if, if I ask it what the, the Q value in this state is, given an, an action A, right, it should, and actually, this here on the right hand side isn't super correct, it should uh, give me the it should give me the same as if I take the reward I'm actually getting by doing this action, plus the future reward from the new state. Now you'll see there's action A here, action A actually needs to be marginalized across, um, action A needs to be marginalized across this policy. So this is not action A from here. Um, but you can kind of see the basic principle the Q function needs to fulfill the fundamental recursion of Bellman, which means that the Q function in this state must somehow be the reward I'm getting by following the Q function, plus the Q function from the next state onwards. And even if I don't know the Q function yet, I can kind of regress to myself. So I can, even if this is a crappy estimate as of right now, and I know if I'm in state one, I do this, I go here, that gave me a reward of maybe four, right? then I know, aha, four and eight is probably 12. So this here, I really underestimated the total reward I'm going to get to at the end of the episode. So I should probably change that I should make that 12. Right. And if we iterate and iterate, we're going to get better and better estimates and sure that might fluctuate and so on. And that's one of the problems of Q learning. But you kind of taking your own estimates as targets, um, you combine them with the actual rewards that you get from the world. So you always say, well, the reward I'm getting plus what I estimate my future reward is, that's my target for the total current reward. And Thereby, you can reduce the whole problem uh, to just estimating single step. So the, the single step is then the reward that you get from the world, that's a real number, needs to somehow be the Q function in this state minus the Q function in the next state. Okay. And you're going to train your Q function so that this difference here matches the reward that you're getting. And you usually only train one of the uh, parameters here, and the other one you you kind of keep fixed. But I guess you could train both at the same time. I'm not sure that's a super good idea. And that's how we get to this paper. Deep Q learning considers Atari games. So Atari games lend themselves quite well to the combination of deep learning and Q learning, because you have an input state, which is quite complex. So you can't do this with tabular Q learning, you have to do this with neural networks. So the input state is quite complex, lots of pixels and so on. But the output action space isn't that big, you can go like on an Atari, you can go like left, right up, down, press a button. And that's kind of it. Um, you have some combo actions of all of these, but the action space is very limited. 
and thus they can actually do queue learning right here. So you can see here the fundamental um, equations that we've gone over. The uh, Q function with the star is the optimal, the Q function following the optimal policy. That is if um, I have my reward from the current step, plus if I follow the, if I follow the best action in the next step forward. Okay, and this is the actual correct way of writing it right here. I botched that a little bit. I hope this becomes a bit clear now. So the the Q function of the optimal policy is whatever the reward next step is, plus the Q function for the optimal policy from the next step on out. Here is their loss function. As I said the loss function is yi, yi being maybe they say that somewhere yi. Let's see. Ah, there we go, where yi is this plus this. So essentially what we what we've just seen. So their their target, their target is the right hand side here. And um, so the right hand side must be equal to the left hand side. Bellman says for the optimal policy, this must be true. And therefore, why don't we just make it true using gradient descent? So the gradient they consider here, the gradient of the loss function is going to be um, you differentiate through the Q function of the current state, uh, you keep the Q function of the next state fixed, the reward is fixed anyway. So therefore, you're going to take whatever you estimate currently and make it closer to whatever it should be. And again, that includes your own estimate of the future. And that's why it's a little bit different than like supervised learning or or something like this. So if we think of this in language modeling, right, you always have you have a sequence of tokens. And if you do autoregressive language modeling, then for each for each token that you output, uh, we'll start one later for each token that you output, you actually have a target in mind. So it from the here you predict this, but you have a target. And then from these two, you predict this one, but you have a target. And that's why you can do supervised learning when you do autoregressive language modeling, because you always predict the next token, and that's a defined next token. And that's either correct or not correct. Um, if we talk about reinforcement learning in language modeling, it's more like where well, the whole sequence is going to be predicted first, and maybe at the end, you're going to get some reward. And then you need to figure out well, which of the tokens actually were the good ones, the bad ones, and so on what you should do next. And that's where currently in RLHF, proximal policy optimization is used. But it could be conceivable that Q learning can be used as well. Because in language modeling, we have a sequence or a partial sequence, that's the input, and we can encode those really efficiently using transformers. Um, and we have a fixed set of outputs, namely our token vocabulary, uh, even though that's a, quite a big set of outputs, we have a fixed set of outputs, uh, being the token vocabulary um, that um, that defines defines our action space, so to say. So Q learning is not too, you know, too, too far out there, except that with such um, high action spaces, it in my understanding, it tends to become a little bit brittle. Let's just quickly go through uh, what what they do right here, they have a few tricks up their sleeve. One is this experience replay. Uh, so they don't just always learn on policy, but they have a bit of a buffer of things they do. So in deep Q learning for Atari, they uh, do episodes, they with probability epsilon select a random action, otherwise select an action according to the maximum of the current estimate of the Q uh, function. Again, we don't have it, we need to learn it. So at the beginning, it's going to be crap. But as we go on, it's going to improve and improve and improve. And thus, we're going to play better and better 
and better games, which leads us into states where we can explore more and more the good paths, right? And if we just explore the good paths, then um, yeah, technically, we could explore everything, right? Technically, we could just run a random exploration in this environment and then learn from that. However, however, um, that tends to not be too good as long as like, as long as these states are really big. So if there are many, many, many states, we don't just want to do a random exploration because we with high probability, we will never reach the interesting states and or not enough, not often enough. And therefore, we'd rather already start going along the good trajectories as we learn the Q function, right? And only with a small probability do something random, so that we explore a little bit, we don't get deceived by always going into what we think is the maximum reward direction, because it could be that you know, right now I have to do a little bit of a suboptimal move, but then there is much more reward. And that's what the exploration is, is supposed to do. It doesn't work in all environments. And there have been even books written about the deception of uh, rewards and the deception of goals and so on, notably, um, in even in the machine learning field. So don't don't recall what it's exactly called, but you'll find it. Uh, what they do then is they execute the action and they observe the reward and the next image. They set the next state to be okay, that, that's a, a step. Um, they store the transition. A eventually, they'll sample a mini batch of transitions. So the transitions include the current embedding of the state, the action, the reward and then the next embedding of the state. If it's a terminal, they just set the target to the reward. If it's a non terminal, they set the target to that Bellman recursion, and then they perform a gradient step on the loss function that we've seen before. And that's essentially it. And that's what gets you a uh, giant super duper company that's getting acquired by Google. <laughs> and I mean, it takes a bit more than that. But this is really what put them on the map. Uh, back then. So I hope this was a little bit of a dive into Q learning uh, into what it does what it means. Again, we consider the Q function, the Q function is something that tells us if you did an action right now, um, if you if you did that, in the state that you're currently in, what would the reward be? Not just now, but until the end of the game. If you follow, if you commit to follow a certain policy afterwards, and then we said, Well, what is what if my policy is just I'll always ask the Q function what I should do. And that led us to the realization that hey, um, yeah, that's possible. In fact, it gives us a nice recurrence uh, relation that essentially says the Q function now is simply a combination of the reward that you'll get next step, and the Q function of next step. That again, uh, led us to a method of saying, well, okay, that's cool. What if I don't know the Q function? Well, then I can just use this recurrence relation to learn it and learn it, meaning I can break down the whole problem of ooh, what if the reward is like forever, and there are many steps and which is which, like which piece of reward is responsible for which action here and so on this whole credit assignment problem, I can break it down into just learning from single steps, because I'm always saying, well, whatever else happens, the recurrence relation must be true for a single step. So the reward I get for a single step must be the difference between what the Q function told me last step, and what the Q function is going to tell me next step. And that I can use to learn the Q function, at least the Q function of the optimal policy. And we discussed a little bit that initially Q learning was done really with tabular Q values. Uh, but more and more, as we move into modern ages, it can be done with neural networks, where 
you encode the state into a neural network and you ask the neural network, you know, for each of the actions, what would the output be? This could be done by having one head um, that just has an output for each available action, or by also encoding the action and then have uh, one output. And also encoding the action is going to allow us to go to a lot more complex actions, even continuous actions and so on. But we will not go over that right now and here. I hope this was at least somewhat informative and current before everyone goes out and, and runs around and, you know, hypothesize about Q star. Keep in mind, this, this is entirely possible. This has nothing to do with Q star at all, but it could. So stay hydrated. Bye-bye.